Hey, welcome everybody. It is Tuesday at 1 p.m. My name is Ryan Catherwood, back with you after a little bit of a hiatus, guest hosting today an episode of Advancement Live. Thrilled to be here from campus of Longwood University. Advancement Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network, a series of professional development web shows. Also have podcasts available through iTunes, always free and accessible to you. Check out the archives on higheredlive.com. Head over to iTunes and you can subscribe to the Higher Ed Live podcast. If you want to be part of today's conversation, please use the hashtag HigherEdLive on Twitter, and I'll be monitoring the Twitter account, and we'll be happy to ask you know, your questions to today's guests. Uh, and uh, lastly, be sure to subscribe to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. You can also do that by heading over to higheredlive.com and subscribing. So I don't know if you uh, may have realized this, but this is, in fact, a presidential election year. Uh, unless you have been living in a very dark and quiet closet, uh, you are fully aware that we are in the depths of campaign season. Very exciting, because here at Longwood University, we were selected by the Commission on Presidential Debates to host this year's vice presidential debate uh, on October 4th. And there are many, many really fascinating aspects uh, when it comes to putting on a debate. Uh, but today, we are going to focus on engagement, on volunteerism, and we're going to talk about programming that helps foster a sense of school spirit uh, that brings the university community together. Uh, in order to get us framed up for that conversation, we'll begin today with uh, a little history lesson from Moira Kelly. Uh, she is with the Commission on Presidential Debates. Uh, she also has a day job, if you can believe it or not. She is the president and CEO <laughs> of Explo, uh, as well as the associate producer and director of education outreach for the Commission on Presidential Debates. Moira, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so glad to be here. Absolutely. And then after we have a chat with uh, Moira, we will talk with Carla Schuster. She is assistant vice president for external relations at Hofstra University. And Hofstra had the honor of hosting presidential debates in both 2008 and 2012. Uh, Carla, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. It's great to be here. Glad to have you. But first, we would not be what we are without a word from our sponsors. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner and iModules. Get, get the latest white paper from iModules to learn about online giving trends in higher education, including a 24-hour giving campaigns, crowdfunding, average gift size, and more. And our very good friends at M. Stoner. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communication firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. M. Stoner is offering a free webinar on visual design for digital stories on July 20th. That's tomorrow. Uh, do you know how, how, str how strong visual design supports storytelling? In this webinar, M. Stoner will explore principles for creating visual interfaces that encourage reading, exploration, and interaction. Registration is free, and I've tweeted out a link for that. Okay, so back to the show. Back to me here at my desk at Longwood. All right, we're in the saddle, uh, and I'm excited for this episode. I've been planning it for a little while now, and Moira, it was great to meet you in person when you came down for a site visit, uh, but I thought it would be great to start the conversation today with a little bit of uh, context. Can you talk a little bit about why universities are selected as partners to host presidential debates? Yes. You know, I think one way to look at debates is that they are, it, they're a way to educate the public. And if you're looking at impact by having them on a college or university campus, it means that you can have really a season of impact as opposed to just the moment of the debate. And I think that in addition to that, if, if a university handles this well, and almost all of them do, they see the opportunities for education and voter engagement and really bringing civic matters to life 
through having the debate there and lectures and panels and outreach to the community and it makes the event itself much larger and I think that the length of the impact and the depth of the impact is just greater uh, than you would have for instance if you just did it in a studio. Yeah, and, and just being part of the, the, the team helping to put on the debate at Longwood, I can also add that it has been really a positive experience from a team and collaboration standpoint, uh, not just the deep impact on the community, our different stakeholder groups, but really it has brought uh, the, the leadership and, and the university together around the process. Yeah, I, you know, Brian, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I think uh, I've heard from a lot of institutions that one of the great benefits, uh, there are wonderful benefits, right, to, to doing the debates, is that it brings a team together in a way that it feels like if you can do this as an institution, you can do just about anything. And, and sometimes that's what a, 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 a you know, institution really needs. And so um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Absolutely. It's been a really great experience so far. I mentioned in my introduction, Maura, that um, you, know, you are actually the, the president and CEO of a nonprofit uh, of where you live. And so this is, uh, probably feels like a full-time job, right, uh, in uh, this time during election cycles. But you, can you explain a little bit about um, the, the team at the Commission on Presidential Debates? Yeah, um, so there are, uh, y you know, I think uh, in the end, one of the things to remember is that the primary goal of the CPD is to get these debates out to the public, and to do that, there is uh, quite a large production team that is engaged for quite a long period of time. I think you found out in October, November, right. that you would be hosting a vice presidential debate, and probably since that point, you feel like you've been running to get this thing ready to go, uh, because there are a lot of elements to getting this off the ground and part of it is that obviously your institution and everyone else's institutions were not built specifically to host debates so lots of this is going through facilities saying how can we turn something into something else and uh, and some of that requires um, electrical and it requires figuring out where you're going to put trucks and we've, we've got a lot of people involved with us uh, who work over the year with um, coming up with how we're going to turn a debate hall which oftentimes is a gym or an athletic complex into something that can hold some very significant rigging and we've got generator trucks we've got to put uh, in close proximity to buildings uh, the Secret Service gets involved because there are security issues and so we've got various members of our team who live in various parts of the country who are on a regular basis dealing with host institutions to work through each one of these issues so the by the time the entire team comes to campus, we're ready to roll. Yes. So um, why are there three presidential debates and one vice presidential debate? Uh, it's a formula that's been in place for a little while now. I think this year uh, Longwood, of course, is hosting the vice presidential debate, but Washington University in St. Louis, uh, UNLV, and Wright State are the other host sites. Um, what is the, what's been the formula there for that sort of the number of debates? I wish I could give you a magic answer to this. Uh, I, I, it's been you're right. It's been this way for some time. It seems to work well and. Other than that, I really can't tell you some deep uh, background to why we ended up doing that. And but it has seemed to be something that's worked out uh, well. And I, you know, it could could well be that if it, something works, don't change it. But I, I can't really <laughs> say more than that. You know. Well, that's a good end of reason as any, right? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it could be. <laughs> but so from the standpoint of engagement and you know the value the opportunity for a host university to engage its stakeholders you know how does hosting a debate help uh, what are, what are some of the, the best the benefits that host universities see from this an engagement standpoint you know hosting a bait is just so exciting I don't know if you're finding that it's exciting there you know it's it's such a way to get your community excited about 
the institution, about what's happening in the world, that your institution is tied to the rest of the world. And so it's something that alums uh, are very proud of, generally speaking, that an institution is hosting a debate and they want to find out what's going on. I think it also creates a lot of opportunities for the host institution to reach out. So both reach out and to pull people in. So it's pretty typical that a host institution would be sponsoring lots of things, uh, activities on campus, festivals, exhibitions, panel discussions, lectures, uh, sometimes dances, you know, uh, really lots of, they're inviting the community to come in and help celebrate what is coming. And in, in another way, they're also reaching out into the community. So they are, it's pretty typical that host institutions would reach out to the public schools and to civic organizations and others because in a lot of ways it, it's not just the host institution who is hosting it's the entire community it's the town it's the city uh, and oftentimes it feels like the state's doing it too so there are lots of ways that people can connect with one another and it's uh, it, and people feel like they are doing a public service and it really is a public service these these debates require a lot of work but it's a lot of work that, uh, that's very important and people like feeling a sense of purpose and I think it, it generally does that for most institutions yeah and as you say so there, there's the debate itself right there the event on October 4th here at Longwood uh, where the candidates will be here, and all the events and initiatives that are here on campus uh, coinciding with that with that event. But then there's all of the other initiatives, right? Oh, that yeah. are that are um, you know in the in the six weeks prior, once students arrive back on campus, uh, to you know the the week before, and then of course initiatives that are um, that are designed to to go along via after the debate has it has been finished, including ways where debate related themes have been fused into many different of the of the courses here at Longwood. And so there's some really exciting opportunities I think to to engage not just around the, the big event, but to yeah. watch it as it leaves a mark on the on the university for a long time to come. Yeah, I think that's such a good point is that this is seeing citizenship in action, you know, and so oftentimes on a campus you can talk about these things and but it's a bit of an abstraction, but this presents an opportunity to really apply what you're learning in class and so it's it's pretty exciting and the more that institutions share that with their surrounding communities, the better and 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 almost all the institutions institutions do. They, are, they really do an extraordinary job with pulling people into this event. Absolutely. And you know, one of the, the most important pieces of the puzzle is, is volunteers, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, to, to, make, to, make, to make it all go around, you've got to have lots of people throwing their hands in the air. I think at Longwood we had close to a thousand uh, students, yeah. faculty, staff, community, alumni raise their hands, offer to help. Why is it so critical to the success uh, of a debate uh, to have lots of volunteers? Well, you know, if you haven't been around one, it can sometimes be difficult to just understand how many moving pieces are involved with this. It's extraordinary. And, you know, at any given debate site, you might have, for instance, 3,000 plus members of the media coming to campus. And they have to figure out where to go, and they need support. Uh, you, But you also have things, you know, you're converting athletic centers into completely different kinds of places. Security is needed. Um, there are people who uh, just helping run offices there are runners, there are, it's just, it's hard to just even imagine how many people are required to pull this off. And I think, you know, it's proportional to how much impact you have. I mean, the institutions want to have a tremendous impact uh, on the community and uh, show themselves off well. And to do that, it's a pretty people intensive experience and so that's one of the reasons why having them at college campuses means that there can be a greater impact but it also means that there's much more support that's needed to make that impact happen. Yeah, I think you know our, our volunteer uh, management team spent something like you know eight to ten hours together in it last week just making sure that 
all the different volunteers were, were grouped in the right places for the right times, and it, it was a really extensive uh, and challenging initiative. But ultimately, yeah. the, there was great value in, in providing that volunteer opportunity. Well, I think the other thing, too, is what it does, uh, particularly for students, is brings them you know, very up close and personal to uh, not only working with people at the commission, uh, but seeing how the media operates. They are there in the debate hall helping us seat people, and it's just, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's real work. It needs to be done, and it needs to be done in a professional way. And I have, over the years, I've been doing this since uh, 2000, actually, Students have been extraordinary in, in their professionalism, and many of them talk about how transformative an experience this has been for them. It really it, it shows them how important democracy is and how important uh, that we need to be in, in having this right that we can vote uh, and uh, an acknowledgement that uh, the debates play a pretty important part in that. So it's it's the volunteer. I know. Thank you so much to your institution and to all your people. It's uh, I know it's an extraordinary amount of work for a lot of people, and I hope you're finding it's worth it. I think so. Uh, so so by my count, Moira, this is the fifth uh, presidential cycle that that you have been through since 2000. I just did that real quick. Yes, uh, I guess it is. <laughs> uh, and with, with that in mind. Can you talk a little bit about a couple of examples of great engagement programs you've seen over the over the previous election cycles? You know, I think that uh, it to a little to some extent it's unique to each place, and uh, but I think that. Uh, we there have been some extraordinary outreach efforts that certain uh, schools have done. Uh, for instance, writing curriculum uh, for grades K through 12 that they have made available not only to their local public schools, but they've made it available on iTunes for the entire country. You know to download. Uh, there are. Um, there have been some wonderful things going on on campus that uh, schools have. Uh, Hofstra, I know, has done just an extraordinary job in the past um, bringing people onto campus. Loads of programming, and um, so uh, you know, I I don't want to sing. I, I don't have a particular one that I would say is the most extraordinary of them all. And and I would say more than any particular event or initiative, uh, it. it it's that um, most schools have done quite a few. Uh, they, I mean, it's it's. This is not one person heading up programming or one person heading up curricular changes. This usually these are fleets of people uh, doing lots of things, and on any given day uh, leading up to the debates, it wouldn't be unusual that multiple things are going on, uh, both before and after the debates. So. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that lots of people, and there's a lot of amazing initiatives. And I think, you know, universities are, are trying really hard to maximize the, the experience in its entirety, right? And to make sure yeah. that, that 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 the entirety of, of putting on a presidential debate um, has long-lasting impacts well into the future. And and also, you know, put together, a, assemble a, a, a story, right, that, that we can tell. Uh, that has lots of different parts, and, and we can share how, with uh, long into the future, how how the debate at Longwood went in 2016. Well, I think that's interesting. Is you know, there's in some ways the one way to think about it is there, there's the kind of overarching institutional story, but then you've got thousands of individual stories um, with people's individual experiences. And that's what I think makes these debates so rich for an institution, because you both have that collective experience that happens, and then you have all of the individual experiences that are happening. And that's what makes it a transformative experience for so many people. Yeah, and I think you know part of the richness of the experience that that you mentioned is um, is is also really challenging because you know politics and the rhetoric surrounding it are, are often mm -hmm. divisive, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're here to celebrate our differences, right? In the form of of, yeah. of, pos of positive um, political discourse, appearing on the stage together, shaking hands, having a disagreement, and it's really really special, but. How do universities yeah. build unifying school spirit around something like 
political discourse when it is often so so divisive? Well, that's a good question. You know, I, I think one of the things that most institutions aim for in general, debates or not, is they're hoping to bring students together to explore the world of ideas and differences in philosophy. I mean, th these are learning communities. Uh, and I think that, you know, the debates should be a learning opportunity. And I think that your point of celebrating the opportunity to disagree with someone, you know, in public, that is something that we should celebrate. I, it, you know, it, it's very easy and understandable that we can feel right now like, oh gosh, you know, it seems like people it, it's, it might be out of control or people are yelling at each other, whatever happens. But I think one of the things that we've got to remember is that we have the right to do that, you know, in the United States. And, uh, you know, my hope would be that people listen a little bit more. Uh, and, um, and, you know, and obviously, you know, it, 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 most of us think that respectful conversation is a good thing. Uh, and I think that uh, higher education institutions are because they've got people thinking about the learning aspects of this, that there are opportunities in classes and through extracurricular programming and other things to bring people together, separate from the debate. You know, that's when panels are coming together. That's when discussions are happening, that uh, you can have people debate and uh, I'm not necessarily saying that they're going to come out of this doing high fives with each other you know after it's done but the opportunity that we have to have these conversations to listen to each other and disagree with each other vehemently um, but that one of the things that uh, colleges and universities universities can do is promote how do you do that and do it in a respectful way so that we can go back to our dorms or other places on campus and still live with one another. And I think that colleges and universities are in a unique position to make that happen. And so I hear you uh, that things are a little different maybe perhaps a little more divisive uh, than we might like, but I think that in the end what we've got to remember is that this is uh, something to be celebrated, that there are debates and people are having them, uh, because there is an alternative you know, version of the world where those things don't happen and that wouldn't be a good thing. Absolutely. And it does take some you know, additional, um, some learning, I think, here at the university. One of the things that we did uh, a couple of months ago was to bring in someone who could help us uh, learn how to better facilitate classroom yeah. conversations around political discourse, right? So to make yeah. sure that leading up to a debate, uh, a, a debate season, we'll call it, uh, that we are that we are prepared and have some some tips and some training on how to to moderate and to move conversations forward positively. Well, I think that's a really responsible way to go about doing this, and I think in some ways, you know, that's a great lesson for other colleges and universities. That's a life skill that students should develop how you engage with people who think differently from you and it's a real gift that institutions can give to their students if they can give them guidance on how to do that. So um, Moira, one of the things that of course has changed since when you first started in 2000 is the, the prevalence of social media, of digital oh, engagement yes. <laughs> opportunities, uh, of programming of you know on the part of universities that's tied to social media, but Sort of from a bird's eye level, you know, what have you noticed that universities have really tried to do from a digital and social standpoint to to engage audiences, stakeholders in meaningful ways? Well, I think you know it's not surprising. I mean, the social many people are on social media, and consequently, I think virtually every um, institution is, uh, you know, using uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, you know, I could go on, I don't want to leave anyone out, um, but uh, that uh, that is, uh, you know, that happens, that starts happening well before the debates and um, while the debates are going on, although on some level we would like people focused on the debate itself, I, I you know, there are going to be people tweeting about what's going on. Uh, and various other things, and um, so it's it's. Uh, I would anticipate that um, it is um, going to be. Sorry about the the telephone in the background there. Um, the 
um, I think that uh, things will continue to change, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some Facebook streaming uh, that goes on, you know, um, this time around. And one of the, one of the things I think is interesting is that um, each time, uh, you know, the, the, there's a new debate season, there's new technology and, and uh, new opportunity, and uh, so uh, you never quite know what's going to happen uh, at the next debate, and I suspect that the use of social media is only going to continue to grow and it's certainly at, on the top of people's minds how they can use it well and um, so you know I don't have specifics um, in terms of any new 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 kind of thing happening but it's something that's uh, that everyone's trying to tie into in fact uh, Dominican University uh, is working on a project with the Commission on Presidential Debates where they're doing lots of outreach through social media to college students and they are doing some interesting work with that and I think one of the things that social media presents us with is a real ability to have virtual connections with people in real time over the course of the debates uh, and uh, over the course of the whole season of the debates and so it's a way to be connected with people that we just didn't have in the past when I first started doing the debates. Yeah, well, it is fascinating too. I mean, we're we're working with with a lot many of the social media companies for our physical for their physical presence here <laughs> on campus, right? Sort of yeah. a social media row, and <clears throat> excuse yeah. me, to to, pre, to organize in advance fifty to seventy five live tweeters who are representing uh, you know undecided viewpoints, right? Mm -hmm. Who are organized as part of the part of the part of the, the debate uh, event itself. Um, yeah. So it's really fun to be a part of it and to, to watch it organize. Um, so last question, Moira, before we, we talk with Carla about, about Hofstra University and its uh, presidential debates. If, if a senior leader at a university was considering the idea of hosting a presidential debate in 2020, yeah. uh, what are the most <laughs> important considerations? We're already talking about 2020. It's true, yeah. Uh, the most important considerations. I think... One, you have to really, really want this. And what I mean by really, really wanting it uh, is, uh, Ryan, you've seen this. This consumes your institution. Um, and it is very time consuming and it's resource intensive and it requires tremendous teamwork so it can't be just one person or two people who think this is a good idea your team your senior administrative team your board of trustees everyone has to uh, embrace this and uh, and it becomes your project uh, for the year for year out from when you're doing this and it will take over like, large parts of your physical plant uh, for some period of time. Uh, it will take over loads of time for your communications department, uh, your, um, you know, the, it, it, as you, you said, Ryan, just getting people together for volunteering and other things. So it's, um, it is perhaps one of the biggest things that you could take on as an institution or people have taken on. There are lots of reasons why you would want to do this uh, and there are great things that can come out of it um, but people shouldn't minimize how challenging it can be to pull off an event of this type. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Moira, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation today. Um, very exciting time that we're in here. Political seasons are full of energy and I've got no doubt uh, you will be a very busy person over the next uh, couple of months. As you say, it is layered on top of our, our, our day jobs, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hosting presidential events. fun, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But it is fun. Um, Carla Schuster from Hofstra University, thanks for joining the program today. Um, and you were not a staff member at Hofstra when you hosted the debate in 2008, but you were a participant. Uh, and then you worked for Hofstra in 2012. Can you talk a little bit about your roles and some of the things that you observed? Uh, sure. Hi. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, so yes, as you mentioned, I was here at Hofstra for both 2008 and 2012 debate cycles. However, when I was here in 2008, I was here in as a reporter. 
uh, and working for Newsday, which is the local newspaper here on Long Island where Hofstra is based. And I was here on campus uh, covering the debate, but not from the perspective of the candidates per se, but um, from the perspective of the impact on the institution and on the community and uh, on the students. Uh, so I was involved in the coverage of all of the activities that were uh, in, that were involving Hofstra students and then also the impact for Hofstra as an institution sort of in the greater world. Um, and then uh, about a year after that I came to work here at Hofstra in my current position. So when 2012 came around um, I was involved both in the media relations as well as working on um, some of the student engagement programming and event programming that we did around the debate. So. Um, for uh, I can tell you that it was easier in 2008 than it was in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> easier, easier for you or for Hofstra? Uh, you know, um, for me personally, yeah. um, <laughs> and I think I think you know I was very lucky. Just also speaking personally, in 2012, because. Um, everything changes, right, in four years, not just the candidates in some instances, but certainly you mentioned social media, that changes, you know, dramatically and exponentially. But luckily, I was surrounded by a team that had largely done this four years earlier. So I was incredibly uh, grateful to have that group of people to sort of um, tap into. And, and so while I was sort of reinventing the wheel sometimes, other people weren't. So that was great for me personally. And I think it did help us um, as an institution in 2012 because I think it helped to guide everything that we did certainly and related to what we're talking about today, student engagement, it certainly made a difference in you know, how we chose to plan things and the type of outreach that we did both on campus and outside of our own borders. Yeah, you know, if you think about it and you look think back in history, you know, in 2008, I think I still had a MySpace account, right? <laughs> and, uh, and you know, and Facebook, you know, was around, but it, right. but, you know, it wasn't, it hadn't hit the critical mass it has now. You know, the changes from 08 to, to 12 are, yeah. are are were amazing, for, particularly from a digital standpoint. Hmm. Uh, but you know, thinking about one of the stakeholder groups, uh, Carla, your alumni community, you know, how could you tell that they were engaged around around the debate. What, 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 how did you get a sense of their overall involvement and in general school spirit around it? Um, I think obviously some of this we heard from alumni through our alumni affairs office, but I, I also think that in terms of measuring it, and these things tend to be more challenging to measure, although frankly easier now than they were even four years ago yeah. um, with the explosion in social channels, but um, we looked at it based on you know, social media in 2012, certainly, you know, uh, we looked at social media in terms of, uh, you know, our Twitter following and our Facebook likes. Uh, we looked at attendance at events. We started uh, our debate programming actually the spring semester prior to um, the debate in October of 2012. Uh, so we had a series of events over the course of six months, right, starting in the spring semester and then in the early parts of the fall semester, and most of them were open to the public. So we could see based on the attendance at events, um, you know, and we would also actually get emails and letters from people um, back in the day when people still wrote letters, um, uh, you know, from alumni who would tell us that they were, you know, incredibly proud. Uh, to be associated with an institution that was doing this and doing it for a second time consecutively, which is pretty rare. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you know, there's only a couple of universities that have done that. We, we, we talked a little bit about that beforehand, mm -hmm. um, that being Wake Forest, Washington University, and St. Louis, uh, and you guys, right? And uh, that, I think it shows that uh, Hofstra did a really great job and obviously um, really wanted to do it again. Uh, so mm -hmm. after the 08 experience, you know, you signed up again in, in 2012. So what did hosting the debate in 08, how did it prepare you for 2012? I know some of that would be anecdotal from talking with your with colleagues, but what was your sense of some of the things that you, you guys learned? I think that, um, you know, it was not unknown entirely, right? And that makes people a little bit uh, calmer and, and feeling more confident, which goes a long way uh, yes, when you're putting on an event of this scale. 
Um, I think in the, when it comes to both the student engagement, community engagement, as well as media relations, speaking for the parts of it that I was involved in, uh, it, we knew more about uh, what to um, expect and um, what people would be looking for from us. Uh, and I think we also had the 2008 experience to draw on when we looked at ways that we engaged our own students and in particular the ways that we engaged um, the community outside of the campus borders. Uh, Moira had talked earlier about schools reaching out to um, students in particular outside of the campus because for us and for most institutions I imagine that do this, um, student engagement isn't just about our own students but about students um, from the surrounding communities, K-12, and I think we did a, a, a substantially larger effort to bring in K-12 students. We had something in the neighborhood of 2,500 to 3,000 that came onto our campus for the events that we had, both in the months running up, and, and we did this by sending out you know, specific invitations, by setting aside specific amounts of space for them, um, you know, creating some special programming for them in addition to the public programming. So I think we had a, a, a better sense of what worked and what didn't and what we could do more of to make that experience better for everybody. Yeah, fantastic. And, uh, you know, the, the K-12 experience I think is such a rich one because then not only are these, um, you know, folks who are students who are eventually um, being brought into the to the political process and having a broader understanding, but then from a university standpoint, these are potential um, potential students at your at your university that may be compelled by uh, their experience on campus and in this capacity. I know our K twelve team here at Longwood has been in touch with yours and some of those initiatives. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you had a big um, uh, role within as you're part of the external relations team at Hofstra when it came to digital engagement. Um, mm -hmm. what, what were some of those signature initiatives that, that you guys rolled out in 2012? Um, we did some stuff with social media, um, although, you know, I, I think now at the differences uh, between what we do every day with social right. com now compared to then, um, we had a student live blog. Uh, that um, started in the spring of 2012 and then um, continued throughout um, the semester and then really ramped up in those days running up to uh, the debate uh, where students would live blog both video and photos um, as well as text about things that were happening on campus both event-driven, interviewing classmates, behind-the-scenes stuff, um, you know, so we had that. We had what we called debate TV, which was specifically little video vignettes that were more heavily produced, um, that were about different things happening on campus. Snapshots, not necessarily just event-driven, but snapshots of the way the campus was experiencing the debate. Um, and we also uh, did some stuff um, around uh, getting media, sort of working with media to have more digital engagement, um, whether it was in working with TV stations that were doing live broadcasts on the day of the debate, or working with um, radio shows ahead of the debate to sort of promote engagement on campus. So there was a lot of there were a lot of different things that we did. Although I often think about you know sort of I imagine as you pointed out sort of what the social aspect of things must be like this cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, been a real challenge, and you know, part of the the social aspect again revolves around around volunteers. And how did you how did you engage and involve alumni volunteers you know, here at here at Longwood? We're working on sort of watch watch party type mm -hmm. engagement offerings. Yeah, I mean, our watch parties, we had um, a couple of watch parties that were student watch parties, and then we had some watch parties that were public watch parties, community watch parties that we promoted to our alumni as well as the surrounding community. We did not have alumni volunteers in the way that we had student volunteers, right? We had something in the neighborhood of 350 to 400 student volunteers that were, you know, all over campus working in the debate hall, working in the media filing center. We didn't do that for alumni. Um, we really focused... Um, um, on engaging alumni in the public facing events that we had um, and using those as an opportunity to bring them back to campus. Yeah, absolutely. 
And you know, I think that as we, as social media has emerged and we're using it as part of our, our workflow every day at the university level, it, we begin to think about different opportunities. You know, you send them a debate watch kit, right? And then when you get when you get the kit, take a picture, right? And when you yeah. put out a garden mm -hmm. flag and take a yeah. picture and share it, and you know, put out you know your the cups and plates that we're using uh -huh. for your watch, take a picture and share it, you know. Uh, and there's a great opportunity to volunteer, I think, from uh, in that digital engagement mm -hmm. space uh, for alums who can't make it to campus, or perhaps uh, you may encourage them to not try to come to campus since it is such a <laughs> uh, uh, potentially depending on depending yes. on your campus, right? Yes. Uh, there's uh, different uh, different opportunities yeah. there. Not with, along with alums, we want you all to come to campus. Come, <laughs> come and watch the, the debate here with us uh, on the on the big screen. Um, but uh, so, what, Carla, were some of the most exciting and maybe some of the more disappointing results that you that you noticed from your work engaging Hofstra stakeholder groups? Um, I think uh, that. Um and I'm going to speak uh, both sort of from a personal perspective as well as from a professional perspective, that one of the more sort of inspiring moments uh, actually happened, oh, there were several of them, I guess, it's sort of hard, but the day before the debate, we did a, a series of events uh, called Expressions of Democracy that included a lot of different types of activities largely performance-based, right? Uh, there was a democracy dance project where we brought kids on campus to work with our dance students to do sort of a dance performance based on social issues. But the signature part of that was something called Democracy and Performance, which we had done in 2008, which is where we had professional performers, uh, professors, and students who were involved in our um, rhetoric and performance studies program inhabit historical characters um, and then perform as them, right, and use those performances to tell the stories of these seminal people in history. Um, and so we invited many of the school children that I talked about earlier came onto campus that day. And they came and sat under big tents on the quad and watched the various performances. And then after the performances, these historical characters would roam around campus and just interact, um, you know, randomly and casually with people as their character. So you would have a conversation. You would chat with Teddy Roosevelt right. or, you know, James Weldon Johnson, who was a, a, a poet and teacher and was the executive secretary of the NAACP. Um, the, one of our students played him and, and talked about his role in the civil rights movement. And James Weldon Johnson also happened to be the, uh, the author of the the um, song Lift Every Voice and Sing. And so at the end of that particular set piece, um, the student sang the song. And uh, as he was singing it in the beginning, four or five students just got up and began to sing with him. And by the time it was done, everyone under that tent was singing along with him. And, you know, he's described that as sort of a, a perhaps the most important part of his time here at Hofstra, you know, that this was a goosebump moment. And to me, that sort of, that's the, that's the home run of engagement because you have one of our students who's having this incredible moment related to what he's studying, right? Um, and you've got all of these students who have been inspired and, and hopefully can draw a very direct connection between what's happening in the world and what's happening right there in that moment. Um, so that was probably one of the more exciting moments that I um, can talk about from 2012. But, and you know, I think performance is such a great aspect mm -hmm. to to really you know take advantage of in terms of developing programming. My alma mater is the University of Richmond, and they hosted a, mm -hmm. a debate in uh, '92, I believe it was, um, so maybe '96. And I know one of the most successful engagement programs they did was when the theater majors. Um, first tried out for and then dressed up as a Perot, Clinton, mm -hmm. and um, Bush and did a mock debate, mm -hmm. not 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 you know for the for the you know, club Republicans or Democrats, but as an entertainment event, right. right? And and that was really well done. But I think you're right on the money when it comes to the goosebump moment, right? Being the the one that really uh, folks will remember. So um, Carla, thinking about broadly measuring success uh, at Hofstra, 
how, you know, when you look back on it or when people reflect on it, um, how, how were you able as an institution to, to judge whether hosting a, a presidential debate was a successful experience? Um, I mean, there are some metrics, right, you know, whether it's, you know, as I said, social metrics, you know, Twitter followers, Facebook likes, and that kind of thing. Um, it's attendance at events. It's the number of students that we had apply to the debate ticket lottery with someone in the neighborhood of 7,000. It was the number of students we had apply to be volunteers who ended up being volunteers. You know, all of those things that you can, in fact, measure to some extent. Um, and then it's also a feeling, right? It's, you know, we were talking about democracy and performance and those goosebent moments. It's the feeling that you get walking through our student center on the day of the debate when there's all sorts of activities happening, engagement activities, the media is there, you know, and it's the buzz and it's a, it's a cliche, but it, it does fit, right? There isn't a palpable excitement on campus. And um, when students talk to you and talk, tell you that, you know, I applied here because of what I saw and in four years ago or, you know, this is so cool and it sounds so simple, but they get it, right? And they, and you see, you talk to students who are politically engaged and how much more active they've gotten. Talk to students who never voted before and are voting this time around. So, I mean, I think that there's a combination of, you know, actual numeric measures and then there's just the feeling, right? The the anecdotes that you take from it and say to yourself, okay, you know, we know that we we know this is having an impact on our students. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so last question is an advice question. I asked Carla, uh, more, excuse me, an advice question at, at the end of her segment. So what advice do you have for schools like Longwood University, my, uh, my, my great employer currently, <laughs> Uh, as they, as we roll into the debate sequence here in the fall, what is what is your advice for, for me and the other host universities? Uh, take a really long vacation when it's over. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I think that's uh, in the works. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you mentioned it, right? Which is your social media row, and and which I think sounds fascinating. It was certainly not something that we really had to that degree in 2012, and I would say social, 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 and more social, right, in terms of promoting the events now, promoting engagement and interest now, um, tapping into, to the extent that it's possible, the real-time conversation that happens um, at the debate that precedes yours, um, and then in keeping it going at the debates that follow the one that you're hosting, because, you know, these are all, because people, because Twitter, especially, right, is a real-time um, channel, part of, of being a part of the event is you can't come to campus and hang out with your friends and watch a debate, but you can hang out with your friends online and talk about it yeah. and be part of a larger community that way. So, I mean, and there's also ways to sort of promote things in terms of, you know, whether, as you said, post pictures of yourself with, you know, what you're going to be wearing that day or your favorite t-shirt or, you know, uh, your university blanket or however it is, but just also engagement around the issues, right? Um, I know, for example, just, you know, what we're doing now, for example, around the conventions is we're putting out there some, you know, some video uh, through Facebook Live and, and just in other types of video um, of our professors who happen to be at the conventions with some of our students talking about what they're seeing and giving some sort of expert analysis, which is a way to sort of keep people engaged in um, the issues, but also engaged with us. So, I mean, that's, I would say video and social and particularly Facebook Live to the extent that you can make it happen would be the two biggest pieces of advice that I have in terms of engaging people. Fantastic. Advice well received, I, I'm, I am sure. And uh, thank you so much, Moira, from Commission on Presidential Debates, for joining us today. Carla Schuster from Hofstra University, AVP External Relations. I really appreciate your time, energy, and insights. Thank you so much, and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Ryan. Oh, great to be here. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you for all of you who tuned in to listen, and whether you're listening live or whether you are checking out this in a rebroadcast format or by, uh, by podcast, appreciate you taking time to listen to Advancement Live. Do come back again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.